through the list. Now, uh, we don't really have any since uh, I think we had the holidays. Uh, there's no really big updates or anything. We do have a Facebook group and we have a mailing list. And um, we are starting to do meeting recordings now. We have three up available online on YouTube and Vimeo. However, uh, we're still kind of working out the keeps with the audio quality and the video quality. Uh, we're trying to experiment with different software, and so it's just kind of a testing phase for us right now. And we have an IRC channel, irc.freedo.net. You can go pound town, open NSM, and hang out in there. And there's a nice little bot that will give you a nice little uh, CVE and related security fees if you ask it. And let's go ahead and move on to the meeting section. So there was a a security research, researcher released a uh, potential vulnerability in LEST. If we can go actually open up here this little link. Uh, yes. Yeah, the ubiquitous LEST. In the subject tile, a Linux LEST can probably get you owned. And it basically has to do with a option that LEST has called LEST Open. Oh, there's another one called LEST Closed. And these allow, basically, their input preprocessors. Let me go ahead and increase the size of my font size here. So um, this is man last real quick, real quick. And if you go to the variable section, you can see there's a number of environment variables that left sets so or that you can use that will uh, interact with less and do particular things. And one of them is open, less open right here. So it's a command line to invoke the optional input preprocessor. So basically you call a program with less, less runs that, that, that program or that file that text file, whatever it is, through the input preprocessor. And essentially this, this um, results in if you have an input preprocessor that has a possible vulnerability, well, uh, if, you, if you craft a particular file that someone will then open with less and they use that input preprocessor, then it's possibly exploitable, depending on the application, the type of vulnerability in that preprocessor. So this happens on when you open less. What is less close? which um, I guess on OS 10, my version of it's probably on like a new less, but on the less, uh, there's a less close variable which actually runs the, the, the command on, on close through an output preprocessor. And you can see in my case, I actually use less open, and I have it set to this. This is a uh, syntax highlighting, so I don't like to always open my source code into uh, this. I can do it with less, and it pipes it through and passes the as an argument to that script, and then essentially colorizes it and then passes it to less. And you kind of see what it looks like here um, on a shell script. But I have uh, let's do in shell. And you can see now this is highlighted with less. Well, that's kind of cool, right? Because um, normally less it doesn't have syntax highlighting; it's kind of boring. So essentially, that's what that is. So. In this case, uh, Michael, or Mikhail, I'm not really sure how it's pronounced, he, he crafted a specific binary with CPIO and was able to use the preprocessor to actually exploit it with the, with the uh, overriding the bounds of a buffer. And, and you give the examples here, you can take a look at it, and he has the, the, this available. That this is potentially exploitable. So that was one of the more interesting things. What else we have here? Uh, Docker vulnerabilities. So there's a few of them that came out, actually just two in the past week. And so here are the two CVEs. And uh, what essentially the first one is, CVE 2014-6407, uh, uh, basically when you extract an image, there is a potential for a hard link or sim link traversal. And this happens on the Docker load or Docker pull uh, commands. So when the image is pulled in or, or loaded from a tarball, in the case of Docker low, it is then extracted. And it's possible, because of link traversal, to overwrite files on your host system from those inside the Docker image. But that has been patched, and Docker 1.3.2 remedies this. Uh, also, there is uh, 6408, and this was a potential, uh, or older that lead to uh, privilege escalation for a container where specific security options are passed to the container in a malicious way. And I haven't gotten, I haven't seen any examples of this, but I think this actually goes back to, um, in Docker 1.3, they released dash dash security dash ops, and that allowed, allowed you to pass uh, app armor and SC Linux policies. 
to the container. So I feel like this is probably where that's coming from because it, it says it affects 1.3 and, and forward. So that option was introduced. So it looks like you could do some uh, crafty stuff with the policies that will then enable you to potentially compromise the actual host running and not, and not just the container. Uh, wire edit. So this was a, uh, a tool that I discovered on the, one of the broad mailing lists that someone posted about. Wire edit is a full stack. What you see is what you get edited for network packets, right? So we can actually open a PCAP file and edit the field of packets directly and save it. And it has a nice uh, pretty interface or somewhat pretty interface. It's, uh, right now it only runs on uh, OS 10, or excuse me, Linux and Windows. I can give you a quick demo to show you what it looks like outside of the video. Uh, I guess the windows being open right here. And what we can do is just click on this. I didn't really play with this much, but I downloaded it last night. And so open this PCAP that I had. Shane, did you just hit record? I forgot to tell you. Oh, I hit it earlier. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so here, here's a, a bunch of packets, right, and the timestamps, et cetera. And say we want to change this one, you can dive down into it. Oops, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted this EDP packet. And so it's kind of like similar Wireshark in this, in this particular packet view, or the packet detail pane was called in Wireshark. And say we want to change a particular port or a particular piece of the packet, and we can change the destination port here. So we can right click on it, and then we can set some value, and it could be anything. I'll just do 299 for 2900 because I'm uncreative right now, and hit OK. And then it'll recalculate the checksum, and then we can save it and essentially have that. So this allows you to sanitize some of your packets or potentially um, check out vulnerabilities in packet crafting software or just how they handle particular things by editing them and seeing how they, 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 they respond to your changes. So then we can save it as a new PCAP. There it goes. All right, so that's a quick example of wire edit. Fairly simple interface. There's only a few buttons here, and you basically click on your packet and change the fields. All right. And then, um, so Brian Krebs' new book came out. Uh, I know Wayland's read it, and I started on it last night, and it's really interesting so far. A lot of uh, name dropping on uh, people from the Russian Business Network. So it's uh, I highly recommend it. Here. And one thing I discovered was that I'm reading on a Kindle Fire HDX is that now they, if a number of people highlight a particular passage, it actually recommends or it says that, hey, seven people have highlighted this, which is kind of it's very distracting, but it's also kind of interesting to see what other people have highlighted. I highly recommend this book so far. It's, uh, it's been interesting. I've learned a number of new things. And then Security Onion now has uh, packages for Snort 2.9.7. And the data acquisition library, 2.0.4. And if we go back, there's a number of new things that came out with 2.9.7. Uh, they had uh, open, uh, let's see here, uh, oh yeah, open I app ID detect for content for the application identification preprocessor. And there's a, there's a number of new contents or modifiers like protected content rule. And then um, they actually have the ability to, to decompress um, flash content with uh, Place in LZMA algorithms, and you can use that from the HTTP preprocessor. There's a number of other improvements, so that gives you a, a you can actually view this link to see more information about uh, what the new version uh, allows you to do. Uh, paper period. So paper period is where we we like to uh, review an academic paper or some piece of research and present it. And I had a plan to do this one, the Count Me In, a viable distributed summary of statistics for securing high-speed networks. traveling all day. By the time I got home, um, I didn't really want to do it. So I apologize. We'll do it next week. Um, so signature selection. I'll move right on to that section. This is where if we find out some new interesting features that came out for any particular IDS, we can talk about it. And uh, Vlad actually got this into Bro now. So it's in the Bro policy. 
in the frameworks under the software category. And he was he live here. Nope, he's not. So in this particular one, he's, Vlad's using um, crypt, the crypt DLL file to actually find out what version, basically the string of, of what is seen across the wire, to find out what version of Windows. So it's, it's a version detection uh, piece. And you can see that particular event, HTTP log, HTTP is going to log an event, it checks for the host being of Microsoft.com, if there's CRL, uh, some of the host, and it looks for the Microsoft-Crypto API string in the user agent field. And this, if it's in there, then it's able to call this event to say that the software has been found, and then, it's able, then it, from there it will log in. It's essentially what this comes down to. So it's really cool um, a way to do a detection. So you can see how he has this large um, table here of uh, doing the mapping where this is the version, if that is seen, then this is the version of Windows that it's on, see Windows, Major 5, Minor, et cetera, et cetera. Any additional field he has, the year, or, or the, the service back. So that's, that's kind of, it's a really cool script. Thanks for writing that, Vlad. And then, uh, well, that summarizes all the, all the beginnings now. We're going to move on until our, to our guest speaker here. Um, so uh, Brad, Brad is with us today. He's going to be talking about uh, malware traffic analysis, and he runs the popular blog, uh, blog uh, malware-traffic-analysis.net, which is a really cool blog, and many people are following it. It basically has a number of investigations each day or about every day from the work he's doing. And you can actually download the PCAPs and the pieces of the malware and, and further investigate them. So it's a really cool uh, site he's been working with. And we appreciate that. He's also 21 years of classified intelligence experience for the U.S. military, and now he's a traffic analyst or a traffic analyst. And I want to give it up to Brad. And Brad, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make you a presenter. All right. Get the pop-up box? Uh, I don't see it yet. Okay. I've got an option to uh, change the presenter over here. Let me give that a shot. Okay. There we go. Ah, okay, so I guess he still had you on there too. Cool. Okay, give me one second here, pull up your your presentation, get it on our screen. Excellent. All right, I got you on full screen now on our projector, Brad. All right, thanks, John. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad. Uh, as uh, John mentioned, uh, I operate the uh, the uh, blog uh, malware-traffic-analysis.net. Um, he asked me to uh, speak here, and uh, uh, this is the first time I've uh, done a presentation, uh, which I'm titled Adventures in Traffic Analysis, just kind of give you a, uh, a history on uh, uh, my particular career trajectory, uh, some of the interesting uh, uh, traffic uh, that uh, I've analyzed uh, over the past uh, couple of years, and uh, uh, some other it, uh, methods of uh, that I use to uh, try to generate full infection chains and uh, uh, for the blog. So we're going to uh, go through. I'll describe how I started out, and uh, I'll talk about gaining experience and developing uh, skill in this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, line of work. Some of the interesting investigations that I've run across uh, during the past uh, couple of years. When I established uh, the blog about a year and a half ago, and then we'll look at uh, see if I can generate a uh, full infection chain uh, while we're here uh, during the meeting. So when I started out, uh, I retired from the uh, one of the branches of the uh, U.S. military. I did uh, classified intelligence work. Uh, I had a security clearance, which was a prerequisite for a uh, particular job 
uh, uh, for reviewing IDS events as a defense contractor, which uh, uh, when I left the military, I started doing that in uh, the summer of 2010. Uh, I only had the security clearance. I didn't have any of the necessary experience, although I had uh, plenty of uh, analytic just not in uh, computer network traffic. So it, uh, as long as I demonstrated that I could uh, uh, do the work and I could get the required certifications according to the Department of Defense Regulation uh, DOD 8570, I, I, I was able to keep the job. My 2012 an opportunity had uh, come up that was uh, too good for me to pass by and I moved over to the commercial sector. Uh, in the image there, you can see uh, a bunch of uh, companies on the left associated with, uh, on one side associated with uh, government uh, contracting and uh, on the other side you see a bunch of uh, commercial companies. Uh, I can say that I've worked at least one of the contract companies that's shown over there, but I cannot say that I've worked at any of the commercial companies in that image. So there were, when I started uh, as a defense contractor, there were a lot of uh, pros with that uh, uh, particular uh, uh, place. It definitely was a more secure environment. This is a uh, military network. So the mindset is that you're defending yourself against an adversary. That's uh, uh, one, of the top, one of the top things uh, uh, as a member of the military. Uh, bases are guarded. Uh, the networks are, uh, by definition, more secure, at least by design. And in that environment, there was uh, it, was, it was very structured training and evaluation for the particular job that I had to do. So I was well trained to actually do that particular line of work in that particular environment. There were a few cons uh, for my first analyst job. Uh, one thing in the uh, defense contracting environment, at least in the area that I worked at, the were there was uh, strictly defined job rules. So I was an analyst, I was reviewing IDS events. So if I found something interesting, I had to pass that off to the incident response team, who would then coordinate with the associated base or the associated post or the associated military installation and uh, uh, work with uh, uh, whatever uh, communications organization that they had on that installation to resolve an infected computer or whatever issue was coming up. So within that work environment, you didn't have an opportunity to really branch out and grow and experience new things. You were contracted for a particular job, and that's the job you were have to, that you would have to do. You were not expected, you were not encouraged to uh, go outside of your job role. Another thing about the uh, my first analyst job is because it was a defense contractor job, uh, contracts change every uh, couple of years or so, and they often go to the lowest bidder. So, uh, for example, Six months after I had gotten uh, uh, my job as a defense contractor, uh, that particular contract changed companies. So six months later, I had to change companies in order to continue doing my job. Uh, in my case, I got a small bit of a uh, pay bump, but uh, I was starting out pretty low as a way to get my foot in the door. So uh, uh, a lot of people uh, in some cases like this uh, uh, will actually see their wages uh, decrease if they want to keep working the same exact job. Uh, there's also the uh, sequestration that was going on at the time, uh, 2012, we were starting to hit rumblings. Uh, if they're going to shut down the government, uh, you know, it, it's very hard to, uh, uh, it, there, there is a question of making sure that you receive a regular paycheck. So when the opportunity came to go to a job uh, in the commercial sector and this particular opportunity at the company I'm currently working at. Uh, at the time it was just too good to be true and uh, it, it, for me it was the right decision. And uh, uh, I've, I've definitely learned a lot since I've uh, moved over to the commercial sector. So how do you gain experience and develop skill to be able to look at IDS events? IDS events are re reviewing network traffic, looking through IDS events, determining what's malicious or what's not is uh, not a widely 
uh, known and, and, and skilled. People always seem to be looking, companies always seem to be looking for people that have experience in a uh, sim, uh, reviewing uh, IDS events, and uh, uh, analyzing network traffic. For me, coming into this uh, uh, particular career field, I did not have a uh, uh, sysadmin or network type of background. I did have an analysis background, but I needed to know what I was uh, what I was looking at. One of the first certifications I got in preparing for this line of work was uh, uh, Network Plus. So uh, studying for that particular certification uh, um, really helped me understand uh, you know, what networks were. Well, there was a lot that I didn't know about, and uh, starting out, uh, if you don't know networks, it, uh, that definitely is, uh, in my personal opinion, a non-vendor or a vendor-neutral certification to start with. Uh, CCENT, the Cisco certification, the basic uh, networking certification, is also another one that uh, uh, is on par with Network Plus, but it is uh, a little more vendor-specific. You also have to be familiar with various uh, types of uh, operating system and network traffic uh, that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're pulling up a uh, network traffic and looking at a PCAP from a, a particular host on the network, there's going to be all sorts of traffic that, unless you understand what it is, uh, you, you might make the mistake of thinking that something that's completely normal looks suspicious. Uh, DHCP traffic, uh, for example, or uh, uh, NetBIOS name service over uh, UDP port 137, uh, stuff like that. You need to, to be able to, to, to know this stuff so you can actually filter all that out and concentrate on the important stuff, which would be the suspicious network traffic. Another thing that I found extremely helpful in this line of work is uh, knowing Wireshark. Um, I've been fortunate in the places that I've worked at to have access to uh, full network uh, traffic capture. So if we get an IDS alert on a, uh, uh, some suspicious activity and we're able to track down the, uh, the IP address it's coming from, we can pull traffic on that particular IP address it, uh, and uh, be able to look at all the network traffic that was going back and forth between that one particular host. Uh, to be able to look at that in Wireshark, to uh, know how to display the information properly. This goes more than uh, uh, just following a TCP stream and looking at the text uh, uh, of a particular TCP session. Uh, this means being able to filter in Wireshark on uh, particular types of traffic, being able to look at that information and, and uh, uh, organize and sort through it in a uh, uh, coherent manner. Another thing that's really helpful for this type of work is using virtual machines in Security Onion. Uh, there's a, a variety of virtual environments that you could use. Uh, Security Onion, uh, which I believe Doug Burks uh, spoke at uh, one of the uh, one of the meetings here uh, uh, earlier this year, is definitely a, a godsend. It uh, really helped me uh, uh, in my travels in network traffic analysis. However, the most helpful training that I got when I started out as a, as a defense contractor was the SANS 503 intrusion detection in depth and the GCIA certification that at the time was required by uh, the DOD 8570 regulations for uh, computer network defense analysts, which is the position I was working at. So uh, um, it definitely is expensive. Uh, I just checked the uh, website yesterday to see how much it would cost if I were to purchase it uh, on my own, and it's nearly $6,000. Uh, and this is a video or an uh, on-demand course. This is not uh, counting in-person training. If you were to actually go to a conference and uh, uh, have an in-person instructor, uh, it would probably cost about uh, one or $2,000 more. So I do not know yet anybody that has paid out of pocket uh, uh, for this certification on their own. And uh, anybody that does have this certification, and I've known uh, a couple of people, I've known at least at least two people that have had this certification, and then they uh, switched jobs and they didn't need it, so they didn't bother to maintain it. And then uh, uh, one person actually uh, interviewed with my current employer for a job, and we require this uh, particular certification. 
it, well, I should say that's one of the certifications that, uh, 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 that we desire and all of our analysts will have it. However, uh, it doesn't look very good when you're coming in for an interview and uh, you ask about the certification, you say, yeah, I had it, and then I let it go because I didn't need it at my particular job. It basically means that uh, you don't care about this line of work enough to keep an expensive certification. Another way of uh, uh, just knowing more about network security monitoring is uh, this particular book. Uh, I would imagine that uh, most of the people here are familiar with it. Uh, the Practice of Network Security Monitoring by Richard Betlick. Yep. Uh, he also did a uh, previous book that uh, I'm much more uh, familiar with. I actually read through this book as a part of a college course. And uh, uh, the Tower of Network Security Monitoring, the book uh, uh, on the one side of the screen there, is... Uh, was, go ahead. I was, lucky, I was lucky enough to have that book in one of my college courses as well. It's a great book. It is, it is, and, and it was very good. Uh, the, the practice of network security monitoring is basically an update of the Tau of network security monitoring. Uh, so the practice of network security monitoring was published in 2013. Uh, the Tau was published in, uh, originally in 2004. Uh, this book is really the one to get for now. It, it definitely, it, uh, the uh, practice covers security onion whereas uh, the Tau basically uh, uh, was using Snort running on uh, FreeBSD as a uh, method of uh, generating IDS events. There are a few things to remember uh, um, as you're trying to develop yourself as a security analyst. Um, this type of work is very tedious. It requires attention to detail. Um, it, it, it really does. Uh, you cannot come into this field and expect to be successful if you've got a cavalier attitude about this line of work. Uh, uh, the, the most successful uh, people that I've seen uh, uh, would probably have to be uh, energetic and uh, very anal retentive. You'll recognize different types of uh, malicious traffic and uh, file types uh, only through repeated exposure. Now this is a, a you know a kind of basically a a, a basic tenet of learning uh, in general. But uh, I've seen many people who will uh, uh, investigate a particular incident, and they uh, uh, they discover everything they need to know about it, and uh, they're not curious enough to like really follow up and see if they can generate the traffic again. And they're not uh, they're not reinforcing that knowledge. A few months go by. Uh, the same type of traffic happens again, and then they're basically starting all over. They don't know it. They can find out about it. They can they can investigate it and find the information, but they've lost that that uh, 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 that quick retrieval, that inherent knowledge of going through and looking at traffic, this type of traffic, that type of traffic, on a day-to-day -day basis. To give you an example, um, here is an example of malware. Uh, uh, that I've noticed at least two people look, uh, looked at that file name and said, well, it looks like it's a, uh, uh, an update to Flash Player. And uh, this is not actually. It is uh, uh, that I immediately think Verdum, which is a, a click fraud bot, uh, 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 click fraud malware, uh, basically click fraud being uh, uh, generating HTTP traffic in the background to drive up page hits and ad revenue. So I'll normally see this uh, uh, in drive-by uh, uh, web infections where uh, the malware payload, uh, what I know is Zmot, uh, downloads Verdum and then you start getting all sorts of uh, uh, click fraud traffic. It used to be associated with uh, Asprox. Uh, it's not actually from the Asprox botnet. Uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, there are a couple of people that have made uh, uh, great pains to explain to me that Verdum is separate from the Asprox uh, botnet malware. Another thing to realize is that you won't know everything. Uh, when I was uh, first starting out with my current employer, uh, one of the guys that had been there for a while, uh, very knowledgeable uh, uh, about this uh, uh, line of work, uh, uh, very uh, deep into 
uh, taking apart and dismantling malware and looking at it, uh, he was telling me that uh, uh, that there's a lot of things that he doesn't know. It, you know, uh, uh, basically, you're not going to uh, know everything. You have to rely on your fellow workers. You have to rely on other people in the community to reach out and ask things if you've got questions. Uh, not be afraid to make mistakes. Um, so really, uh, the key point I'm trying to make here in that you will not know everything is that you need to network. Uh, you need to talk to people. You need to attend meetings like this one uh, to be able to you know, make sure you're not missing out on uh, some key piece of information that you just haven't uh, run across or you're not that experienced in. Another thing to remember is that exploit kits and malware and uh, the type of malicious network traffic that you will see as a, uh, uh, as a uh, uh, security analyst, a traffic uh, network, this stuff will change. Uh, I'm sure everybody remembers the uh, black hole kit that was uh, really popular uh, uh, about a year or two ago. And then the uh, uh, Russian authorities arrested the, uh, a, a guy uh, by the name of Ponch sometime uh, in late 2013. So uh, he was arrested. Basically, that traffic ceased to exist. There were other uh, uh, exploit kits that were being sold that uh, uh, took, up, uh, took up the slack. And really, the best way to grow uh, in this career field, and uh, really uh, for anything, is uh, through hard-earned knowledge. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I once worked with an analyst, and uh, uh, he had asked me, uh, what's the best way to become a better analyst? How do I become a better analyst? And uh, that's really the wrong way of looking at, uh, at it. It's not how. You look at the stuff that's out there, you, you find what interests you, uh, and then you start jumping in, and you start looking at stuff. You start making those mistakes. You start, uh, uh, you start generating infection traffic. You start uh, doing this on your own, and making those mistakes, and and figuring out how to set up Security Onion on your own. Figuring out how to uh, uh, how to set up the VM so we can get infected. Uh, figuring out. Uh, for example, that uh, uh, coming from the same IP address when you're trying to infect a uh, vulnerable host uh, uh, will probably maybe have one chance before uh, uh, you have to switch to uh, proxy through another IP. This is all stuff that uh, uh, you can be very, very smart and very, very good at what you do, but uh, uh, there are certain things that you just won't know unless you're actually getting your hands dirty yourself and uh, uh, going through that, uh, and just diving in and making those mistakes. So the question is, how do I become better? Uh, the basically the question uh, uh, the question that I used to ask a lot when I was first starting out is, why is why is this network traffic uh, uh, this way? Why is this happening? And uh, uh, as often as not, people couldn't tell me, and I had to research it on my own. And uh, that definitely was hard earned knowledge. So I'm going to take you through some interesting investigations uh, that I've uh, run through in the course of, uh, of the last uh, uh, two, three, four years. So at my uh, current employer on the 15th of May in 2012 uh, um, in the afternoon, I investigated network traffic uh, uh, that caused the following uh, snort alerts. So this is uh, from the, uh, uh, snort, the, the VRT signature set. Talos, I think they're called now. Um, so we basically had a couple of alerts on uh, Black Hole Exploit Kit. So the results, after, after we used that full packet capture, uh, uh, discovered what the IP address was, looked at what was going to it, uh, uh, figured out who the user was, tracked that person down. Uh, that user on a Windows 7 laptop visited the website of her child's daycare center decided to be compromised and kicked off the following traffic. So in May 2012, I was experienced enough to look at that, to find that in a PCAP of network traffic, you know, okay, this is some sort of exploit kit traffic. At the time, I couldn't tell you whether it was black hole or what, but it didn't matter because at the time, as a uh, uh, security analyst, as an incident responder, I just wanted to know was it malicious? If it was malicious, did the computer get infected? Uh, 
So in this case, and I was looking at, uh, back at the original uh, notes that we had on this, uh, we actually confiscated the uh, woman's computer. Uh, and it was funny because uh, we show up at her work section, me and another guy, and we have a chain of custody for him so we could, uh, uh, so we could take the laptop and get an image of the hard drive uh, 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 and see if it had got, to determine if it had uh, uh, gotten infected, uh, what it had gotten infected with. Um, it, she was saying uh, uh, her co-worker who was sitting right there with her, uh, she said she was going to check the daycare site. He made some crack about, hey, you better be careful. It might be infected. And of course it was. It generated the traffic and we confiscated her computer. Now I include this not because it's necessarily a uh, uh, difficult thing to look at now in retrospect. I include it because at the time, uh, uh, at the time, I didn't know enough and uh, 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 the people that were available to me at the time didn't know enough to determine was malware actually sent to the computer, which now I would be able to tell you, having examined enough network uh, uh, malicious network traffic, I could tell you if a malicious uh, piece of software was actually sent. Uh, if you look where it says set dot jar on the second to last, excuse me, on the second to last uh, line there, that was the Java exploit that was used by that exploit kit. Hey Brad, can I ask you a question real quick? Go ahead. When you say it kicked off the following traffic with these HTTP strings, was that from the Windows 7 laptop that visited the site after it downloaded some malicious binary? No, that was uh, after it visited the uh, daycare center, if I remember correctly, and uh, I don't have the uh, traffic. I was looking to write up the notes that we had. Uh, they visited the daycare center. There was, uh, uh, it, uh, there was uh, some sort of redirect that pointed to the uh, uh, exploit kit. What you're looking at there is the uh, black hole uh, exploit kit uh, traffic. Okay, so, but that was coming from the laptop, not the website. Uh, yeah, the, web, the, lap, the laptop was going to the website, and then the website redirected them to these malicious domains. These malicious domains uh, were hosting the exploit kit, and it sent the malware, uh, the, the exploit uh, and malware to the computer, if that makes sense. Yeah. Here's uh, something that's much more interesting, and it's a good example of uh, how you can be complacent and not realize that something very serious is happening right under your nose. So in October 2013, a little more than a year ago, uh, I was on shift when we received a series of antivirus alerts for uh, Xperia, which is a file replicator, uh, uh, acting like a worm, basically doesn't need any user interaction to uh, start uh, spreading and infecting files. It basically replicates itself at, uh, um, in other files. Uh, this happened after normal business hours, so it was just me and one other person on shift. These alerts appeared in sequence as the malware infected any EXE files on that shared drive. It was a temporary shared drive. There were a limited number of people that were actually connected to it at the time. However, uh, uh, what it basically happened was in alphabetical order, uh, you could just see the directory path, and uh, every exe file uh, that was found on there uh, was showing up as malware. And uh, people had stored some uh, programs and some other stuff on there. And this activity did not trigger any network traffic alerts. We had no uh, uh, warning beforehand that a, uh, a particular piece of malware had uh, gotten on the file server. There was nothing on the network that triggered any alerts uh, uh, that we saw that uh, would have indicated, hey, you've got malware that could possibly be uh, uh, going through your network. So me and uh, my coworker worked with the uh, sysadmins to take the file server offline <coughs> and to find out who was accessing that shared drive at the time. So in the 90 minutes from when we first saw the alerts till the time we got the file server offline, we saw 153 alerts on 231 infected files. They were all EXE files. Uh, now, a few days prior, a definition update for this particular antivirus caused a large amount of false positives, and they were appearing in a similar manner. We were seeing a bunch of 
of uh, alerts that were uh, triggering on uh, uh, a uh, common system file. And uh, while that quickly got resolved, uh, So when we started seeing these alerts off hours, I'm looking at it, I'm going, oh, we're seeing the same uh, exact uh, uh, thing. So I, I thought they were the same false positives. I didn't look at it uh, close enough. Meanwhile, my coworker, you know, about uh, 10 minutes goes by and he says, huh, this looks a little weird, this looks a little different. And uh, uh, if it wasn't for him prodding me, uh, uh, I, would have, I would have missed that particular infection. I'm so focused on the network traffic side of things, I wasn't paying as much attention as I should for other, manner, uh, uh, other means of uh, virus detection. at the time that these, uh, uh, the, the malware alert started, and uh, we had to determine where did the malware come from. Well, there was a, a person, he was uh, just browsing the web. And uh, what you see there in the image is the actual exploit kit activity uh, that would have uh, generated the alerts. Um, however, this traffic happened over a non-standard port for HTTP. So at the time, uh, our, our particular uh, IDS would, if this came over port 80, which is, uh, or any of the other normal ports uh, uh, defined for HTTP, it would have immediately caught this. But it didn't because it was on uh, port 4150. And uh, if you look at the patterns there, I recognize that uh, it, it looks to me like it's a sweet orange for actually uh, uh, sending uh, uh, the exploits and the payload over non-standard HTT ports. So we were able to uh, we were able to track down the infection. We were able to get a sample of the original malware. Uh, the file server, uh, uh, because the antivirus caught it, it was we were actually able to get that cleaned up uh, uh, very very quickly and get that back online. Uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, barely any loss of access to the file server. Another thing uh, uh, that was really interesting for me uh, uh, it happened uh, early last year when I first started noticing it was uh, uh, exploit kits and the network traffic. You're following the TCP streams and uh, you're looking at stuff and it's like, hmm, this looks like it should be a malware payload. This is where I've seen it before, but I'm seeing uh, uh, garbage or what looks like garbage. So uh, here's a good example. This, I want to say it was something probably magnitude exploit kit. Uh, 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 the type exploit kit doesn't matter. And what matters is if you can look at that and see the uh, uh, see the particular pattern there. Uh, so, what's the most common uh, what's the most common character you see uh, there after the uh, response headers? It's an asterisk. So, uh, uh, this was a very uh, big learning point for me uh, um, because I extracted the file. And there it is, all those asterisks in there. And uh, I asked about it on a, uh, a particular mailing list that I'm a, a part of. I said, hey, hey uh, I found this traffic. It, you know, uh, we know the machine got infected. And in the, the case, when I first saw this, it was actually, uh, instead of an asterisk, it was a three. Uh, I saw the same thing uh, with threes. And I said, hey, uh, uh, but I don't understand uh, uh, what's going on here. And somebody emailed me back and said, hey, I recognize that. I've seen that before. Uh, basically, they XORed every byte, uh, uh, in this case, with uh, uh, two-way. So anything that would normally show up uh, in hex in the bytes is zero, zero, showed up as two-way. And everything that wasn't, wasn't a null byte actually uh, was XORed with a two-way and uh, uh, would look like garbage. So that's the way that exploit kits have of disguising the malware as it's sent across, and then it's deobfuscated uh, uh, or re-exored on the local host, and uh, uh, you know then executed uh, behind the scenes. So if you were to take this, and this guy, uh, uh, I always remember the guy's name because uh, he was very helpful, and it was just an offhand thing. It's like, oh, this is exored with uh, uh, two-way. Here's a Perl script. 
and uh, it will go ahead, you know, just you know, go ahead and exit, you know, uh, deobfuscate it for you. So I run the Perl script, and there it is. It uh, uh, XORed every byte with two A. Uh, in that case, it was three three, uh, uh, and I was able to. Hey, here's the malware. Send it, submit it to virus total. Uh, put it through a local sandbox environment. See, uh, uh, see what uh, uh, callback traffic may or may not be happening on it. So here's another one that happened in uh, December of 2013. In this one, uh, this is uh, the old uh, Neutrino exploit kit, and uh, this is the malware payload that's being sent over, and it's XORed with VK, uh, lowercase v, lowercase k. So you can actually XOR the thing with a, a string of ASCII characters or hex characters. So you extract uh, that particular payload uh, uh, from Wireshark, uh, if you can, if it's not uh, chunked, uh, export it, and then uh, you know use, a, I got another Perl script uh, that one of my coworkers uh, uh, helped me work on to figure it out. You XOR it, and there's your malware payload. So yeah, this is very much a learning point for me, and it really is interesting uh, uh, as we get new analysts uh, with my current employer, and we're sitting down, we're training them. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, this is something that uh, uh, many people don't realize happens, or if you do realize it happens, you're not intimately familiar with the ways uh, that uh, the payloads can be encrypted or obfuscated as they come across the wire, and uh, uh, there are. XOR is probably one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, people uh, will use uh, RC4 uh, as an encryption method and get uh, some sort of cipher going. And, and this is beyond my technical capability at this time to figure out. But that's one of the things uh, uh, in my thirst for knowledge that at some point start figuring out. And uh, other interesting investigations. Uh, uh, ask Prox. How many people? Uh, I, I assume, I, I assume at least a handful of you are familiar with the Asprox botnet. So, uh, years and years and years, and it really sends uh, uh, a lot of obvious phishing emails uh, with zip file attachments, and uh, uh, it will send uh, as a trickier way. It will send. Uh, uh, your infected computers as part of a botnet will generate and send out mail traffic uh, with uh, uh, these infected, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, with these phishing messages that have links to malware. So Costco, there's an example of a Costco wholesale email sent by the Asbox botnet. United States Postal Service. FedEx. Line. I think that's a UK thing. Notice that the uh, uh, that the links are actually going to uh, um, they're going to places that uh, uh, are obviously not from these companies. The Amos family, a funeral announcement. This uh, uh, can you believe the nerve that the Asprox botnet has, or the people behind it, to uh, uh, fake uh, funeral announcements? DPD home delivery notification. I think that may be a European thing or a UK thing. Uh, Delta Airlines. They're uh, uh, trying to play on uh, our desire for uh, cheap uh, air flights. Pizza Hut. Is nothing sacred? <laughs> <laughs> Easy pass. Easy pass. Uh, uh, so if you're ever uh, driven on a toll road, and amazingly enough, if you look at this, it, 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 the easy pass, and you think, uh, oh, okay, well, I've used a, a toll road, but you don't look at it closely, you'll actually be fooled. I, I've uh, uh, two people uh, that I've known, and, and this didn't happen on uh, um, uh, uh, my current employer's network because uh, these these uh, uh, these messages are, uh, uh, by and large, almost every one of them is uh, filtered out. Uh, generally, if we see people infected uh, uh, by malware uh, from a phishing email from the Asprox botnet. It generally is from their home email accounts or uh, when they, they uh, take their work laptop, they take it home, they get infected, they bring it back on the network, they plug it in or uh, connect to the wireless, and we immediately start seeing 
uh, uh, the uh, post-infection uh, uh, traffic and the uh, associated alerts. And finally, uh, uh, one of the more recent ones, uh, along with Pizza Hut, is uh, Starbucks. A uh, e-gift or an e-card uh, is nothing sacred. But uh, it, it's always interesting to me. I, 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 I like investigating and looking into these because, uh, uh, not that it's not serious if you get infected, because I generally don't have to worry about the, the, the people it, uh, at my workplace actually get infected from these because these are generally blocked or uh, the few people uh, that have seen these in the uh, report event from like their home email or, or something, they generally recognize these as scams. Now what I'll also say is I look at these as uh, some people will call this stuff spam. This is not spam. I'll accept mal spam because it's trying to distribute malware. I tend to look at this stuff as phishing because they're actually trying to get information. Now, uh, you, could, uh, you could quibble on that because phishing indicates that you're trying to uh, uh, get information, uh, steal information from somebody, and sometimes the malware that's sent by the Astrox botnet isn't an uh, information stealer but more of a click fraud uh, 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 trojan. So they're not actually trying to steal your information. They're just trying to take over your computer so it can be part of a botnet and start sending more emails and start uh, uh, generating click fraud traffic. Now, at my uh, current employer, we have had uh, uh, what's, what's commonly described as advanced persistent threats, where we've had uh, uh, what you look at, you can say it's, it's targeted at people at my current employer. However, uh, uh, you know, that, that stuff obviously I can't discuss. Uh, uh, in some cases, you know, are you exclusively targeted? Or are you targeted as part of a more wide range effort with uh, uh, similar companies or uh, other organizations that may not even be related? But uh, uh, so it, it really has been a fun ride uh, uh, with my current employee. They, they're treating me well. And it, uh, I continue to run across new things. And it, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I liked as a, uh, uh, when I was in the military doing classified uh, uh, intelligence type work is uh, you have an adversary and you're monitoring them in some shape or form. So you're trying to determine what they're doing and through these sources of intel uh, uh, you're able to uh, uh, figuratively have your finger on the pulse of whatever adversary that you're monitoring. So right now uh, uh, and any one of us could do this, uh, is you're, you're, you, you've got a large uh, uh, cyber landscape uh, uh, that really is a battlefield. And uh, there's a lot of adversaries out there. Uh, uh, you know, the Asbox botnet is probably a good example of that. Uh, keeping an eye on the types of scams uh, and the types of email templates that the Asbox botnet uses is very interesting. You've got your finger on the pulse of what they're doing. Occasionally checking the malware uh, that the Asbox botnet delivers and determining, okay, is it the same type of traffic patterns that we're seeing? Are these the same uh, command and control uh, servers that uh, the infected computers are calling back to? Uh, that you've got your finger on the pulse of this criminal organization that is literally worldwide in its reach and you're, you're able to understand and know what they're doing. I, I can't describe it you know, as, as something that is, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, for me it's addicting. For me it is something that uh, I get an incredible rush on. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, the actual work itself is very uh, tedious. However, uh, the significance of what you're doing is uh, very, uh, very big in my mind. So at some point in the summer of 2013, I registered the domain name malware-traffic-analysis.net, set up a web server, and began a blog. When I started it, I just wanted something that was out there. It was more of a vanity project. I wanted to show that, uh, okay, have something that I could point to to uh, uh, my, my coworkers and uh, uh, my peers and say, hey, I kind of know what I'm talking about. 
you know, I'm posting the stuff on the uh, uh, you know, stuff on traffic uh, that I'm seeing, sanitizing it so people uh, 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 don't know where it's coming from. But in my first post of June 18th, 2013, I didn't know about Security Onion. I didn't know what you know, the different types of exploit kit. Uh, uh, the kits that were out there, I was just more concerned that to identify exploit kit activity in general. I only knew what I had with that particular particular traffic was an infection, and I wanted to post that information on the traffic patterns. And uh, it took about uh, I don't know three or four weeks after that before I started uh, uh, going, uh, uh, you know, doing more posts. Uh, uh, it wasn't too much longer after that that I uh, discovered Security Onion. Uh, what I did do is those uh, uh, first uh, uh, half dozen uh, or so blog posts uh, that I redid them because uh, my first blog post was actually Neutrino. I didn't know it at the time, uh, and, and I figured out uh, relatively quickly once I started diving in. Um, so I, my goal initially was to, you know, do a blog uh, entry every week or two. You know, just to kind of have something out there that kind of described the traffic. Uh, what I found was that there were other people, and, and I, I already knew this, but uh, there were other people doing it, uh, uh, doing a much better job uh, presenting the information out there than I was. So what I lacked in technical expertise, I decided to make up for in bulk, in volume, in sheer numbers. So uh, uh, by the time, uh, uh, about Christmas time last year rolled around, uh, I started, uh, uh, you know, every day or two uh, uh, just infecting VMs and getting the traffic and documenting it. And uh, eventually, probably around uh, uh, March or April or uh, May uh, earlier this year, it, it kind of evolved into a particular format that I use. I've got templates. I've uh, figured out a way to uh, kind of tell a story and show the malware and show the alerts that are going on. And uh, 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 I've met a lot of people, uh, I ran across a lot of people, you know, through operating this blog who have taught me a lot. And, um, and uh, in addition to my hard-earned knowledge, uh, there is the knowledge that others have imparted uh, uh, to me, which is not as near and dear to my heart, but it, it definitely has uh, helped me develop as an analyst. So if you haven't already been thinking uh, to yourself uh, or wondering how do you generate an infection chain, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, any, anybody can do it. Just an average person off the street, what do I need? I will look at the VM setup that I generally use, uh, how to find compromised websites, and uh, we'll try to infect a VM. So the VM setup, uh, um, you should have a physical host uh, with a quad-core CPU and at least 8 gigabits of uh, RAM, uh, uh, preferably 16. You'd use uh, any virtualization software. I prefer VMware, the paid version, the VMware Workstation. It costs uh, a little bit of money, but you might be able to get it on sale. Uh, VMware Fusion for Mac is uh, significantly cheaper than VMware Workstation. The only problem is uh, Macs uh, more than make up for it in their cost. And uh, the basic VM setup, I actually have uh, uh, usually uh, uh, Two, uh, three VMs run at a time. So I've got Security Onion in one VM in my VMware setup, and then I've got the vulnerable Windows VM in the other setup. I have that set up, and uh, in VMware, you don't even really have to set anything else up. Uh, Security Onion, the, the, the interface is, uh, that's uh, sniffing the network traffic is running in promiscuous mode, so it's going to see everything that's going to that Windows VM back and forth. How do I find compromised websites? That's, uh, that's a question I've gotten more than once uh, from people who have uh, emailed me about the blog and provided feedback and said, uh, uh, you know, said that they like it. And it's like, hey, how can you find these things? Threatglass.com uh, lately is a uh, site that I've kind of known has been out there, but I hadn't been using it until probably about the last uh, uh, couple of months. And uh, I've been checking it lately and uh, finding, uh, finding some good infection traffic. Scumware.org is another one. 
scumware.org and CleanMX Virus Watch. Uh, those are ones uh, I used to use CleanMX a lot. Uh, usually by the time uh, uh, a website is uh, listed as compromised on Scumware or CleanMX, it usually is uh, more often than not it's, uh, somebody's already addressed the issue. MalwareDomainList.com is another one. Uh, although I uh, used to use it a lot uh, uh, earlier this year, late last year, I haven't been using it as much nowadays because it seems to be reporting not compromised websites that I can kick off an infection chain with, but uh, it more seems to be reporting uh, uh, IP addresses and domain names of the exploit kits, which you can't just go to them uh, and generate an infection chain. It, uh, you basically have to have a full uh, thing. You have to start at the compromised website. There are many other sites uh, 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 in addition to these that you can actually use. And for me, uh, one of the things that I, uh, uh, I will use is I'll get a, uh, uh, you know, say about uh, you know, once every day or two, we'll get an alert on uh, some sort of traffic you know, where there's a, a compromised website and then uh, uh, our protective mechanisms for our network at my current employer will block any malicious traffic. So no infection occurs. We get our alerts, we look through it, and we say, okay, it's been blocked. Case closed, move on. Well, I'll close the case and I'll take that information and take it home with me. Or uh, if I've got time at work, if there's nothing else going on, it's like, oh, I'll fire up a couple of VMs. I'll, uh, I'll uh, go to it and see if I can't infect a VM on my own and say, oh, that's what would have happened if we would have uh, had an infection over our network. And uh, I'm getting an increasing number of uh, people that are actually sending me tippers saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, I got, uh, I got infected after visiting this website or uh, uh, people know what the exploit kits are and they'll, they'll just email me and it's like, hey, good job on the blog. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, this particular site is generating uh, uh, this particular type of uh, uh, exploit kit. And we're like, thanks, I'll use that. I'll definitely use that. So uh, we can try and infect a VM. Uh, how are we doing for on uh, time here? Oh, you're good. Uh, uh, you got about 20 more minutes at your, at your discretion. Excellent. All right. Well, so uh, as you can see, I use VMware Workstation. Here's my infected, uh, I'm sorry, my vulnerable VM. And uh, here's Security Onion. What, I, uh, what I'll show you before I uh, do this is uh, if you're to uh, go to Threat Glass and start looking at the various, the, uh, various websites uh, uh, here that they've said are infected. Now, what I like about Threat Glass is uh, these are the, basically, you go to a website, it infects you. So uh, in order to save time, I actually, uh, you, you can go to a uh, site go through and uh, just download the packet capture. I've already done that to save some time. So uh, if I were to look at this one, Fabric, Fabric, uh, whatever it is, this Russian website, it's like, okay, here's the, so they went to the website and I looked through and it's like, okay, does anything look weird? It's like, well, it's kind of hard to tell if you're already going to a Russian website if you're seeing a, a weird traffic. But I can tell you that these particular lines here uh, remind me of nuclear exploit kit, this, um, this uh, uh, caffeinebreak.co.vu. And so I can look at uh, I can look at this stuff and say, ah, okay, this this looks like exploit kit activity. If I were to follow one of the streams, it's like okay, here's now we're right here, and it looks like it's uh, sent a second time. I think it's the same uh, uh, thing. But uh, let's say I just want to check this. What you can do is you can go into Security Onion and you can play back the PCAP. It's 
So you got to do it as a root user, TCP replay, interface 1 equals Ethernet uh, port 0, and then uh, be able to play it through that way. So now it's processing the file. Let's look and see what we got here. Give it a couple of seconds. Interesting how some of those packets go back in time. Getting rid of some of these. You actually see over here, uh, hopefully it's visible, you've got Nuclear Exploit Kit landing page. Okay, here's a payload uh, URI structure. So you could easily take these PCAPs uh, that are on threat glass and uh, uh, you can play through. Okay, there, there's some more here. There will actually be some uh, post-infection traffic. Uh, so for Security Onion, I'll use uh, uh, what I've been using lately is uh, Suricata. Uh, as the IDS instead of snort on Security Onion because emerging threats, uh, that signature set uh, uh, tends for me to work a little better on that. And uh, uh, another thing is if it's a non-standard HTTP port, Suricata uh, uh, will inspect that. And from what I understand, uh, uh, I think maybe 2.9.7 uh, of snort, uh, a version of snort, the latest version, uh, may also uh, uh, do HTTP type inspection on non-standard HTTP ports. But uh, so I keep, I actually uh, uh, have Snort set up on a, uh, a separate VM so I can uh, look at it differently. Uh, basically if you're to put emerging threats and the VRT uh, signature set and uh, the emerging threats pro signature set, uh, which is what I have here, you'll uh, uh, It'll be a, a bit too much, I find it a little too cumbersome. So I like to uh, keep my uh, exploit kit, uh, I, I'm sorry, my signature sets uh, separate. Uh, there are different categories, I think, in some of the uh, uh, Snort events as well. Um, it's not that they're incompatible necessarily with each other, I just like to keep them separate. So uh, uh, I have a pure uh, VRT type environment for my Snort events, and I have a pure emerging threats uh, environment for those uh, uh, particular signatures. So uh, I also have the Emerging Threats Pro Signature set. You can see some of the post-infection traffic. It's called Top C Loader. And uh, I think that's it for this particular signature set. Brad? Yes? Could you show that, uh, that TC replay command that you uh, entered again? Could I, could I see that TCP, or that TCP replay command? Here it is right there. Okay, that's just the PCAP. Thanks. Yep. So uh, the, uh, in, in Snort, on my, uh, I've got a Debian uh, distro where I've got uh, Snort 2.9, uh, 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 um, not, not the 2.9.7, but 2.9.6.2. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't do the TCP replay on that one. I'll just go ahead and use Snort to read the PCAP. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's actually much uh, uh, easier to do TCP replay on Security Onion. So, and that really is uh, uh, the. I've only got one Ethernet port on this particular uh, Security Onion setup on this VM. So, uh, 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 the double dash intf1 is uh, the you know interface one, uh, uh, the one interface that you're using uh, uh, for this. Um, which is the interface uh, that uh, uh, TCP replay is sending the traffic of the PCAP to. And then once it sends it there, it's like it's, uh, uh, it's reading it. Now, you're going to see the current time that's through, so you won't see the actual PCAP time, but you will see all the IP address and associated ports and events and uh, the time span. There are plenty of other options that you could use with uh, TCP replay. Uh, I just prefer to do it straight. You could actually play it back faster or you can play it back slower. Um, it doesn't really do any good to play it back slower and you may actually miss 
uh, uh, stuff. Uh, packets might be dropped if you uh, play back the, uh, the, the PCAP fast or faster than normal. Let's look at another one of these. So uh, whatever, Lagu Reggae, Lagu Reggae. So I downloaded that earlier. Copy that into here. There it is. So as you can see here, I'm doing the same command, just with a different PCAP. And, and if you're going to, uh, uh, you have to do it as a root or sudo, just because uh, uh, the, the, the interface is promiscuous mode, you can only do that as root. So here's what we're seeing. We're seeing a sweet orange redirection. And we're seeing uh, sweet orange uh, uh, events. If I were to actually go through and look at this PCAP, and I've got uh, I've got my Wireshark uh, uh, display customized. So here's the uh, redirect. If we were to actually look at that, you can see that uh, uh, looks like the original referrer was ad traffic. And if we were to actually go through and uh, look at the, uh, the the payload right there under 200 OK, you can actually see an iframe from this particular redirect domain or gate. I, I tend to call them redirects. Other people uh, that I know will call them gates. I think redirect more accurately describes that. And then uh, here and here over uh, TCP port uh, 12101 is the uh, sweet orange. It's the sweet orange exploit kit. And if I were actually to go back and look, I could uh, correlate that. It's like, okay, the payload request is coming over port 12101. It's coming from that IP. That's what I got. If I were actually to follow this TCP stream, I would see the uh, the actual malware, and if I wanted to, I'm not going to do it on this Windows computer, because I'm not going to extract malware on a uh, Windows computer at all. But uh, I could uh, export this payload here, and uh, um, if I were to do that. You'd be able to uh, uh, see the malware. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, I generally uh, I'll use a CentOS host uh, where I'll do uh, uh, where I'll exploit the, uh, extract the traffic or maybe uh, do it on Debian. Um, the version that comes uh, uh, of Wireshark that comes with uh, CentOS 6 is uh, it, it's an earlier version that doesn't display HTTP traffic on non-standard HTTP ports. If you were to uh, uh, list the uh, HTTP GET requests. So we got uh, we got another one we can try here. Internet dash helper dot ru. There it is. This one happened on the twenty fourth. So after a while, uh, one of the things that I can do now that I never used to be able to do, and, and this is definitely hard-earned knowledge, is uh, uh, because I look at this stuff all the time, I can uh, look at this and I can tell you, just based on the traffic, that this is this format here is magnitude exploit kit. Here's some more stuff as it goes through. Here's some of the post-infection traffic. I just recognize it because I've seen it. Um, Here's uh, uh, some more. Uh, it basically switches from the domain name. You see the uh, uh, 5.133.179.169 is the IP address. 
It's got this very big uh, uh, long domain name. And after a while, it just does it from the same IP. If we would actually look at the TCP stream, you could see the, uh, uh, the malware payload being sent in the clear. And if, once again, uh, these PCAPs that are on threat glass can go through. And okay, here's one. They're, they actually show up in the, the HTTP response headers. They call it a text file. It is not a text file. If we were to actually to look at it, you can see, even though it says it's a text file, it is a executable. But you could export these, uh, uh, submit them to VirusTotal, uh, detonate them in a uh, VM, see what happens. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do here with these uh, uh, with these uh, uh, PCAPs on Threat Glass. And the thing I like about uh, Threat Glass is, you know, the, the stuff's already there, and uh, you can, you can do a lot with it. You know, it doesn't help you if uh, uh, if uh, the malware is obfuscated or encrypted, and you don't you you can't decrypt it for whatever reason then you're kind of stuck. Another thing I like to uh, do is I like to check scumware.org. I'll go to the report section. And wait for this thing to catch up. You got to, uh, every once in a while, you got to enter a uh, code. Okay. And, uh, so let's see, yeah, I'll just pick, a, I like to pick on the UK. So basically, I want to see uh, for HTML Framer or uh, some sort of JavaScript redirect. I don't see anything I like there. Yeah. Uh, but we can try what we can do to see about a live infection. Let's uh, try this one. So what I'll uh, what I'll do here is with Security Onion running. You know, the link to the app data local temp in my uh, vulnerable VM. I have got. Outdated versions of uh, Flash Player, Adobe Reader, Java, Silverlight. On here, so I'm uh, bound to get something. So let's give it a shot here. Dang it. The thing I like about using Bing is uh, uh, if Google knows the site's uh, uh, infected, it won't let you go to it. Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, has allowed, decided to allow people to visit these compromised websites. See that up there? That's one thing that I've uh, noticed. So I can tell you right now, uh, this is getting infected. Dang it. Ah, no. <laughs> no. Can you mail where my... I forgot to disable that. Let me check something. Okay, but I did get... did get a copy of the malware payload. Meanwhile, um, I'm actually seeing the same type of uh, traffic when we played back that PCAP earlier. So I can tell you this is a nuclear exploit kit. Uh, I can tell you right now that uh, um, we've got some uh, payloads here. And it sends the, the exploit kit will uh, send the same payload. I don't have to go through the PCAP to look through it. I could just go through the uh, 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 internet uh, uh, file cache and say, I guarantee you that this is the um, 
uh, the malware payload. And right here is probably uh, one of the flash exploits. Do something here. Ah, oh, dang it. Did not want to do that. Okay, well, that's obviously HTML there. Uh, so I've seen, uh, um, I've seen nuclear. We'll send uh, Java exploit, which it did not do in this case. Um, so it, it tried to send the payload, and, and I just recognize the uh, uh, the structure here. It looks like it tried to send the payload one, two, three, four, five, six times. What, uh, what I'll generally try to do, uh, uh, normally I'll have another VM running uh, um, and uh, record a PCAP within that. But uh, you can always go to the daily logs. I can find the uh, exploit kit uh, traffic here. And there you go. But, uh, this is all interesting stuff. Uh, nuclear uh, exploit kit has been around for a while. It generally does not encrypt uh, the malware payload. So it's uh, fairly easy to give a demonstration like this and uh, just kind of show you uh, how my workflow goes as I'm trying to uh, 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 infect, uh, generate infection traffic for a, a blog entry. Do, do you automate any of this stuff, Brad? Are you, are you uh, just opening the, um, you know, the Windows VM and then clicking on those malicious links and then just... Um, you know, then once you're infected, you do the analysis of security, and then you revert to your snapshot. Is that kind of how you're doing it? Are you? Automated? Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a snapshot, so I can, uh, you can go ahead and revert back to the uh, previous snapshot uh, uh, before, yeah. and uh, set it up, uh, set it up again. I've got uh, different uh, vulnerable uh, Windows VMs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a 32-bit yeah. and 64-bit and. You know, I, I buy the licenses uh, for these uh, uh, things. This is actually the, the uh, um, it, it, what is it? Uh, if it's a uh, OEM license, you're, you're paying a little under 100 bucks. If it's a uh, retail version, you're paying uh, close to 200, depending on where you get it from. I'll normally shop through New Egg if I need a, a new copy of uh, Windows for whatever reason, just to keep it all nice and legal. But uh, yeah, so uh, we've got this going here. I can just uh, you just suspend it, and I should be able to revert back to my snapshot. Do it all again. What I've uh, found is uh, uh, sometimes with uh, different versions of Java, this one, uh, uh, this one with uh, Internet Explorer 8 has uh, Java, one of the outdated versions of Java 6. Um, Got one with uh, Java 7. It's got a, a little more up-to-date version of Flash, but it's still out of date. And uh, the latest one I have uh, is uh, I, I got to update the Flash version. There's been a Flash uh, Flash player uh, vulnerabilities seem to be uh, uh, what the exploit kits are uh, pushing out nowadays. So uh, it, it seems like, uh, uh, from my experience, uh, I haven't seen much in the way of uh, new Java exploits being out there. Uh, uh, normally. When my VMs get infected now, it's either through Flash or uh, through the uh, through the Internet Explorer exploits. 
But uh, so here's the VM that I was using. It reverted back to the uh, original. You gotta get an SSD. This is going slow. I already have an SSD on this system. I just don't have it on the uh, uh, the partition where I've got uh, all the VM stored. So there it is. It's all it's all clean. Nothing in the app data local temp folder. Nothing in the uh, temporary internet files. I could start all over again. So, uh, what kind of IDSs do you usually use in, when you're working in the commercial environments? Yeah, uh, there's uh, there's a variety that you could use. Uh, uh, really, uh, for me, uh, the ones I have the most experience with are uh, Sourcefire and uh, FireEye. And uh, yeah, so uh, um, I've uh, the company I was, that I'm uh, currently at uh, POC the uh, last line. So we tried using their services for a while. It, uh, it, it uh, in the end it wasn't a match, uh, but I believe they use uh, emerging threats and uh, they use a snort based signature set. Um, for the uh, for the sims uh, uh, that uh, collate all the uh, uh, intrusion uh, events. And uh, displaying for you uh, in the uh, government, uh, the the as a defense contractor, I was uh, using ArcSight. Uh, I also have experience with uh, Q Radar, IBM's Q Radar, and uh, Alien Vault. Not too crazy. Oh, go ahead. Is that the o, the O double S I M? Or is that uh, it's the paid version code? of the OWSIM, yes. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it definitely, it definitely is. Uh, the, the thing with uh, you know, say something like Security Onion or uh, OWSIM is, uh, uh, if you set those up, you're you're basically, uh, um, in, in, unless you're uh, uh, outsourcing the support, you're supporting it in a house. If you get a uh, if you get a solution uh, uh, like Sourcefire or uh, uh, FireEye it, uh, uh, or any of the other SIMs, any of these uh, uh, big ticket uh, items, you can purchase uh, uh, support uh, uh, if you need anything above the uh, level of support that normally comes with that. And that definitely is uh, it, it's it, it's interesting uh, from where I sit from where I currently work at to see how uh, uh, system problems are resolved. Sometimes, you know, I wonder, <laughs> it may, sometimes I think, eh, we should just do it on our own instead of going through all this hassle. And other times I think, you know, thank God we got the, uh, uh, the support contract. Yeah, double-edged sword. Well, hey, uh, Brad, it's about time. Uh, uh, thank you for donating your time to us. So yeah, thanks, Brad. It, it was, was a awesome. good presentation. We'd love to have you back in the future. Well, great. Uh, I'll have to uh, I'll have to start attending some of these meetings. Uh, I like what I've seen so far, and uh, I'll be curious to see uh, some of the other speakers uh, that you guys have. I'll have to check out the other videos as well. Oh, excellent. Excellent.